Hi, welcome to God's Stories today. My name's Chris Thompson. You guys coming? Hello and welcome to God Stories today. Um, I feel really, really, really privileged today because I'm in the company of Bishop Graham Tomlin, um, who's had quite a ministry and um, is having quite a ministry. Um, and I really am quite excited to delve into it and to see the, if you like, the details. I was going to say the nitty gritty, but um, the details of his ministry. But before we get into that, um, can I just uh, encourage you to check us out on social media, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Just look for God Stories Today. And if you would like to email me, uh, the email address is God stories today at gmail.com in particular if you're thinking and praying about the possibility of being interviewed yourself um, and i particularly like to encourage you if you've been musing over that for a while now but perhaps it just felt a little bit hesitant towards emailing me um, you're probably just the kind of person that god wants to be interviewed on this channel so remember this channel is about ordinary people who have said yes to god and allow god to do amazing and extraordinary things through that yes so please please contact me Welcome, Bishop Graham. Nice to be here, Chris. We normally start off with a snapshot mm. of where the person is right now, who you are, mm. what you do, how you would describe yourself. That's sure. actually quite interesting in and of itself. Yeah, well, I am uh, the Bishop of Kensington, uh -huh. which is uh, a part of the Diocese of London. And it basically, I look after about, sort of getting on for about 100 parishes across West London, wow. uh, from Harrods to Staines and everything in between, basically, that's what I do. And so my, my, my main job is uh, uh, Bishop of Kensington. Uh, I also am um, uh, the president of St. Melitus College. Mm -hmm. I guess we'll get onto that in time, the, the college that I was involved in uh, helping to get started um, uh, a number of years ago. Now I still keep an involvement within that. Uh, I carry on doing some writing and some um, reading and some theological work, um, big part of my calling, I think. And um, uh, I'm married to Janet. Mm -hmm. We have um, uh, two children, three grandchildren, uh, who are a great delight. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's me. Brilliant. Let's go and start at the beginning. Mm. Where were you born? I was born in Bristol. Were you? In well, we say West Country in Bristol, but you know, if, if you live in Cornwall or Devon, you don't think Bristol is the West Country. Sub country. <laughs> you think it's the Midlands, but we always think of ourselves as West Country. So that's where I was born. But I was born into a. Uh, an Irish family, so so um, all our childhood holidays were spent in Ireland, and um, oh. uh, there's a bit of me which is which is Irish. I always feel, and I've got an Irish and a British passport, um, but that's that was my origins from the West Country. Yeah. What part of Ireland? Uh, well, my the family originally comes from Limerick, uh -huh. although most of my relations live in Dublin. So um, so all all in the south, but um, so we spent a lot of most of my childhood holidays were out on the west of Ireland in mm, a sort of um, guest house that my. Grandfather, we mm. used to run, and um, and uh, so I have very good memories of, of, of um, that as an important part of my childhood, really. Mm. So, what what was your first awareness of God? Yeah, well, again, I, I was brought up in a Christian home. My dad was a Baptist minister, oh, right. um, so kind of God was always part of part of life, and I, I can still remember, um, you know, as a, as a child being encouraged to kneel down by my, my, my bed and, and pray to God. And I can remember my dad sort of um, uh, sitting, kneeling next to me and sort of, you know, um, encouraging me through my, my prayers when I forgot bits of the Lord's Prayer or um, wanted to say what I wanted to say. And um, so I, I do, do remember, I, I certainly remember sort of church as an important part of, uh, of life um, going forward in, in those early days of, of life. And I do remember being kind of nurtured into to Christian faith. So I, I think I, I, I kind of always, in a sense, sensed that there was a God there. I didn't remember any great, you know, moment mm. when it suddenly became, um, uh, you know, blindingly obvious to me that, 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 that God was there. But I think in, in those moments of, of, um, of, of, of prayer with my, with my dad, uh, those moments of, um, 
you know, being in church week in, week out, you know, it was kind of part of, God was part of the furniture. Right. Uh, in a way that every bit as obvious as this lamp is mm-hmm. or this sofa might be. And you just don't question it at that that point. And obviously when you get on in a teenage years, you do start to question it. Mm-hmm. And I, I did in quite significant ways. But um, I think my, my upbringing in some ways was fairly... Uh, fairly st- straightforward in that God was just was 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 just there as part of part of part of life, mm-hmm. uh, in a way that I think was true for many people in our culture mm-hmm. uh, until relatively recently, and so um, uh, so I think that's that's my um, my memory of it, and particularly those moments of of um, of prayer. I, so the other thing I think that did did that I did sort of think about quite a bit during those days was was home, what home means. Oh, right. And I suppose being someone who was, um, you know, brought up in, in England and born here, but also having a, a home somewhere else, because I remember when we went over to Ireland, you know, that's where our family was, where my cousins were there, my aunt and uncles and grand, grandparents and, and, and so on. There was always this sense I think I, I had growing up of, um, you yeah, know, in one sense, you know, Bristol was my home, that's where mm-hmm. I lived, it's where my immediate family were. Uh, but we also had this sort of home somewhere else, and that's kind of where I sort of felt really at home. Uh, where the rest of my family were, and mm-hmm. I think that sort of nurtured in my, in me a sense that, um, yes, this is my this is my home. I kind of belong here in this place, but there's also somewhere else that is also my home at the same time. And I often look back and wonder whether that was a, a significant thing f- for me in that sense of growing sense as an adult of, yes, you know, I have a home here in this this world, but my true allegiance, my true sort of home is. Is, is somewhere else. It is the, the heavenly kingdom of Jesus Christ. So um, that question of home was quite a key thing for me. You very kindly said in your notes, because uh, Bishop Graham did send me through some, um, that actually in your teenage years you rejected Christianity mm. and you had a period of atheism. So mm. we, we mm. built up the, the context already, the powerful notion of home um, and the fact that God was everywhere in your life because your father was a Baptist mm. minister and mm. so forth. Um, but in your teenage years, mm. something happened. Yeah. Would you be willing to talk about it? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a regular thing that happens <laughs> to most kids in Christian homes that you start thinking for yourself after a while. Because mm-hmm. um, you grow up through your early years, you just assume God is there as part of the furniture and that's the way life is. But then you begin to realise that not everyone thinks that. Mm-hmm. That there are people who don't believe God is, is real and who begin to you know, poke fun at your beliefs for whatever reason. And I was aware at school that that was kind of happening as well. And I think I was also aware, I began to be aware of other Christians who, um, this sounds very arrogant, and I think it probably is, and I'm not sure I realised it at the time, but I looked at Christians whose lives didn't seem to match up with what Christian faith was meant to be like, and I thought, well, this doesn't quite, mm. quite, quite work. I began to think, you know, well, these Christians that I see, they don't seem to live in any particularly different way from anybody else. Uh, is there anything really in this this mm. Christian faith? And given that you know not everyone believes this, and some of the cool kids at school didn't really believe it either, uh, you begin to question for for yourself. And so, um, I think around the age of, uh, I think it's around sort of fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, as many teenagers do, you begin to think, okay, well, do I really believe this? Um, and I can remember gradually moving towards what I would say is is real atheism mm-hmm. um, for a brief period. I mean, my, my teenage rebellion was not, it wasn't sort of sex, drugs and rock and roll, it was really Nietzsche. All right. um, maybe that <laughs> tells you a little bit about me, but you know, um, I can remember having a little group of friends at school, maybe a bit pretentious, uh, very pretentious in fact, but we would read these little atheist texts and we would read Nietzsche and we would sort of convince ourselves that we were the kind of intellectual vanguard of the world <laughs> and you know, doing away with God, mm-hmm. and we didn't really need God at all. And so for a few years, I was in that, that place of actually rejecting um, the God and the Christian faith in which I, I, I was brought up. And if you'd asked me during those years, I would have said, no, no, I don't, I don't believe in God at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was, it was definitely a um, kind of an intellectual decision uh, not to believe in God and to try out life without God. How did that feel? Part of it felt liberating. Yeah. You know, I no longer have this God looking over me. I can do what I want. Um, <laughs> there's an element of, uh, of that. Um, but I know that it, it did feel scary. All right. I think that's the other bit, especially late at night when you're kind of on your own, you're lying in your bed and you're kind of thinking about life. I can remember I used to have a kind of recurrent dream. It was something that I'd, 
I think it came from a from a childhood experience. I remember I was playing um, as a kid in the um, I was at the church hall of my dad's Baptist church, okay. and I had a little one of these little dinky cars, you know, mm. and I sort of pushed it along the um, along the, the floor, and it kind of fell in between. There was a gap between the um, the floorboards and the wall, mm. and this little car just disappeared down behind the the, yeah. um, the, the wall. And I can remember thinking as a child, oh, what's happened to it? Mm. Because I didn't know anything about foundations or floors or anything like that. So I sort of had this image of this car just falling through space right. into nothingness. Yeah. And I can remember, you know, that, that, that little tiny experience actually st- stayed, stayed with me. And I actually had this, this dream about this, this little car falling into space, into, into nothingness. nothingness. Yeah. And I think that, that kind of resonated with me during this, this period. Because I think if I was honest, I... You know, in those quiet moments when you weren't surrounded by your friends who were reading Nietzsche and you weren't, you know, um, uh, having a good time and everything else, when you were on your own and, and quiet and that thought that actually there is nothing beyond, mm. there is just empty space, there's just nothingness, it was actually quite a terrifying thought. And so it wasn't there all the time. Most mm-hmm. of the time I could crowd it out and get on with life and, you know, and... Um, pursue whatever I wanted to do but there was that nagging thought at the end can I really live with the possibility that there is nothing beyond mm. what I see around us and it's just basically down to me um, and I think that that nagging thought stayed with me all the way through that little atheist period as a teenager um, but actually you just you can't actually live this way eventually so what would you say to anyone who's perhaps because this, this seems to be quite a common phase in life, actually, yeah, you know. Yeah. And I think it's perhaps yeah. even a good one because yeah. you're, you're yeah. questioning in a real, mm. real sort of life and death mortality sort of way, yeah. really. Uh, what would you say to anyone who's perhaps in the same sort of situation is also, you know, um, nimble-minded enough to actually, you know, go into philosophy and theology and, you yeah. know, sort of like chew it over, basically, yeah. and, you know, sure. come up with their own opinions, as it were. Yeah. What would you say to anyone who's in that phase? Um, I would say d- doubt your doubts. <laughs> um, you know, everyone has doubts about faith. Even when you're, you know, even the most convinced Christian is someone who has doubts from time to time, has moments where you think this is all real at all. You know, mm-hmm. um, and sometimes they become very strong. Those doubts, those those anxieties, those uh, those fears about God, uh, and we can kind of think because our, sometimes I think our secular world tells us that, that well, of course the doubts are real. Mm-hmm. It's the faith that is thin and and, and unsubstantial. Um, but. I think for me, that, that, that thought, you know, can I really live with the fact that there is nothing beyond this, this mm-hmm. world, that when I, when I die, that's it, everything comes to an end, um, that there is nothing beyond what I see. There is no meaning, no purpose, no ultimate sort of structure of the universe. We have just a puff of wind, a, mm-hmm. a sort of accident that has come about just for a few brief years and then we disappear. You know, can I really live with that? And I, I think... What 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 I, I had to do was, if you like, to live with that uncomfortable mm. thought for a while, mm. not just to put it away. I had to um, to live with that and to realise that actually that was pointing me to something really quite important. Mm. And so, so this thing about you know doubt your doubts, um, you know, your doubts about faith, they may not be the ultimate answer. So question them. What are they saying to you? Mm-hmm. Uh, what are they saying to you about life? About the world about God about yourself. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm someone who's, who's always questioning. I think I always have. Mm. You know, people sometimes think that Christian faith is a sort of nice, easy way of life where you don't have any questions. Mm. Nothing mm. is further from the truth for mm. me. For me. Mm-hmm. It's all about questions and exploring those, those questions. But um, but ultimately, in Islamic faith, is something where you don't just live with questions. It leads you towards a fundamental placing your trust in something yeah and maybe getting ahead of ourselves here but um so i think that's what i'd say i'd just say um you know just 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 live with those moments of of um the uncertainty of 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 doubt mm-hmm. uh um and ask yourself can i can i really live with this mm-hmm. uh because at the end of the day you, you, you can't you can't prove christian faith you can't prove god there's a reason why you can't prove god um come on to that if you like but um uh, ultimately, it's a question of where you put your trust. Yeah. Uh, where you where you're going to put your chips at the end of the day on this side or on that side? Are you going to live as if this is true, or are you going to live as if that's true? And the inner conviction of the Holy Spirit along the way. Yeah. So you say in your notes that um, it was your Christian friends 
who yep. I believe at the probably university maybe, um, but your Christian friends who drew you back yep. by their example to faith. Yep. Hmm. Yeah, he's before university actually, he was in sort of sixth form at, at uh-huh. school. Um, so what were they doing then in terms of their example? Well, they were they were they were part of a a, a youth group that was um, uh, around in Bristol at the time. And you know, if, if I'm honest, like a lot of young lads, I went to the youth group for the girls more than anything else. Um, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> and of course not. Um, but I think I they would do things like you know they would um, you know on summer holidays they would go on um, camps to help with disabled children. All right. And I would think, why, why on earth would you do that? Um, surely you want to get out and have a good time and enjoy mm. yourself and you know and see the world and all that kind of thing. Um, uh, they would spend some time, you know, visiting kind of elderly people in the in the in the neighbourhood where, where where we lived. Um, and again, you'd think, why why would you do that? There was a, there was a kind of compassion for others that they had, which mm. I didn't have because I think I was on a rather sort of self-centered little loop at this stage. This was all about me and my mm. discovery of the world and me bravely going out there and leaving behind God and not needing that at all. And um, and I think the, the more I saw them and, and if you like, the sense they had that um, there was something beyond. There was a, there was a, a kind of peace that, I mean, it sounds a bit corny, doesn't it? But there was a, there was a kind of peace they had, which I, I didn't have, mm-hmm. that in those dark moments when I was feeling very alone in the universe, I kind of looked at my friends and thought, they don't have this. They've got a sense that they're not alone in the universe in those mm-hmm. moments when they're lying in bed late at night. They've got someone to talk to. They've got someone to, to mm-hmm. listen to them, which I haven't. And it was that sort of sense that began to draw me back. I mean, the other thing about it, I think, is my my parents at the time, um, they uh, they kind of made me go to church still, you know, rather, very reluctantly. <laughs> And I would go along and I'd sit in the back and I'd sort of leaf through the Bible to find the mistakes. Um, and because uh, I didn't want to listen to the, the sermons and, and so on. And I think what that did in a way, and I, the, the way I think about it is that I think what I rejected when I was sort of 15, 16 was a, um, was a childish form of Christian faith. Yeah, yeah. Something that <clears throat> kind of worked for me when I was 12, but didn't work for me when I was 15, 14, 15 because you begin to think for yourself. And I thought, mm. well, yeah, that's, that's for kids. That's for, you know, that doesn't really satisfy mm. me as a, as a, you know, a thinking adult or emerging adult. And I think gradually what happened is that by being kind of exposed to just reading the Bible despite myself, um, hearing stuff going on at church, even though I didn't really want to be there, mm. going to the youth group for the girls, not for the faith, I, I kind of heard stuff that, that just chipped away at my unbelief. Um, and was there a moment, like almost like a supernatural penny dropping moment, you said, okay, that's it? No. No, it was a period I can remember. There was a period of a time over maybe a two or three month period. Okay. When if you asked me at the beginning of that time, I'd have said, no, I'm not a Christian. I don't believe in God. I don't believe he's real at all. If you'd asked me about three months later, I'd have said, Mm-mm. yeah, I think I probably am. A, I think I probably do believe in God. I do think he's real. I think I am becoming a Christian again, mm. even if not firmly there. So it was a more a, a gradual period of, of, of discovery and of, of, of opening up. It's almost like a door just gradually opening. You know, you see the light coming in and gradually the door opens and um, eventually you, you decide to walk through it. Yeah, it's interesting. I interviewed a gentleman called Brian Reed. He's a mine clearance diver for the Royal Navy. Mm. And he was on the same sort of gradual journey that you're talking about. Mm. Uh, through painful circumstances, actually. Um, check out the video um, on God's Story State. Um, but he said that he knew he was a Christian after a gradual journey because he went along, to, I think it was some sort of conference, mm. and people were arguing for and against Christianity. And he found himself at this conference, or towards the end of it, arguing for Christianity. Mm, mm, mm. He said, oh, well, yeah. I must be a Christian then. Yeah. I've passed over. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds similar to you, like the journey, yeah. and suddenly, over this two-month period, you, oh, oh, yeah, I am a Christian. Yeah, I think mean, that's right. Yeah, and in conversations with, with friends at school, um, especially the ones who didn't really believe, beginning to actually think, mm, I'm not with you anymore. Okay. Actually, now I'm in a different place. Yeah. Um, but I actually, feel. it felt a relief in a way. I think that um, that now in those dark moments at night, I did have someone to talk to. Yeah. That there was someone out there who, 
who kind of cared for me and listened to me and um you know and people can think oh this is you know it's just a crutch to help you believe but you know you're back to this thing about um you know c.s lewis's point about you know we 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 have this hunger for food that's mm-hmm. because food exists um you know we, we we feel thirsty and water exists uh, that somehow our, our our need for significance for something beyond maybe is a sign that there actually is something mm-hmm. beyond someone mm-hmm. uh, beyond it's not just a kind of you know a, 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 um, a sort of empty desire that we have and so so it did feel quite a quite a relief and and actually didn't feel any less liberating that somehow um, uh, coming back into Christian faith and realizing that I actually I, I and I think this is probably partly what it was. I mean, I think, I've, again, the, the form of Christian faith that I'd rejected earlier on was mm-hmm. quite a sort of a bit of a rule-based thing, which sometimes uh-huh. you have when you grow up as a child. You know, you do this, you do that, you don't do that, you don't do that. You know, there's all the kind of stuff you have to, the, the kind of moral structure of Christian faith. And that's what I sort of rejected. And I think mm-hmm. what, I re- what I'd rediscovered was the sense of God as someone who, who, who listened to me, who loved me and who cared for me. And actually that... Um, beyond any sort of human care and, and, mm. and um, was something so significant that actually it, it made sense of of life and it gave me a a, um, a a framework within which actually the kind of the rules actually felt quite life giving rather mm. than, than than life draining as they used to used to be before. And I think that's just something generally true of of Christian faith. You know, if if you don't have the you know the, the relationship at the heart, that 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 deep, intimate friendship and fellowship with God. Mm. Um, the rules can seem just like rules; they just mm. seem, you know, things you don't want to obey. You just you just kick against them all the time. Mm. That's why I think people kind of reject Christian faith a lot of the time. But with with at the heart of it, you know, this sense of a of a, of a, of a warm, um, deep, intimate relationship with God, then the rules kind of work. Mm. They, they're okay. They give you a framework, a structure for life. Before we go into your university years, you mentioned very quickly it made sense of life. And again, forgive me, yep. I'm, I'm thinking of the viewers yep. here. Um, very quickly before we go into university years, what, what, what do you mean it, it made sense of life? Mm. For anyone mm. out there who's struggling, shall we say, with, yep. lo- with what life means, yep. what do you mean by Christianity making sense of life? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's lots of ways you could put it. I mean, one way is, as I've been saying, that, um, that I, I, I sense this, this deep, Mm-hmm. Kind of need for mm-hmm. something beyond what I could see, some someone beyond um, the kind of rather sort of messy world mm-hmm. of my own sort of thoughts and feelings, my own sort of teenage adolescent wanderings about life, and that the, the need for that maybe that was because actually there was a something beyond that. So that's partly why it made sense of it. Um, I think also another another way which it. It, it always made sense to me is that I've, I've always been aware of, you know, it's almost both the, you know, the, the, the amazing capacity of human beings and the, the, the kind of wonder of, of the human race and the kind of complexity of us, us all and the you know, sheer brilliance of what, of what goes on in the human mind and heart mm-hmm. and, and so on. That, you know, we are these amazing beings and yet at the same time we are capable of the most chronic and, and destructive behavior mm. um, and I think that's what I was beginning to sort of dimly perceive when I was looking across at some of the Christians I knew and thinking well they don't, they don't impress me that much um, actually the reality was well, a lot of people don't impress me that much and actually I was beginning to realize that in my own heart as well um, and so this 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 kind of mixture of, of, of humanity is both an incredibly fertile glorious um, this amazing creation with so much potential, and yet the potential for such damage and, and, and heartache and, and destruction. And that, you know, I guess as I began to discover the Christian understanding of creation and fall, that we are both the wonderful creation of God, and yet mm. we are deeply broken and fractured because we've turned away from the source of life and turned away from the source of love. That kind of makes sense to me. Gotcha. Um, so it made sense of life and the tapestry that you it, we all experience yeah, it. Makes sense of the complexity of life in yeah. a way that other other sort of you know um, versions of, of of the of the human story didn't. So so when did the call into the priesthood really start coming to the fore in a very serious way? I think it was in my sort of last year at university and then the first year after that. 
um, towards the towards the end of the university time, you obviously start thinking about what am I going to do with my life? What job yeah. am I going to get? I tried out one or two things, explored a few jobs in you know in um, what we now call human resources personnel, as it was called in those days. Because I was quite like people and working yeah. with people, but um, and I applied for various um, schemes. Uh, in the end, none of those came about, and uh, I, I got a job starting to fill in the time, again, working for a church in London. Um, but also in the back of my mind thinking, well, maybe something in the church might be right for me, uh-huh. uh, because I quite enjoyed this extra responsibility I'd had within the um, uh, within university life. And so I, I applied for this job and was offered it, and uh, did that for a year. And that was in some ways quite a key time for me, just to... to, to Really exploring what does it actually feel like mm. working in a church. And it felt mm. very different from three years before when I was in Pakistan, mm-hmm. where I felt really quite, you know, just unready for this experience. Mm. Um, whereas, whereas now this felt a much more um, engaging thing to do. Would you say you're an apologist, stroke pioneer? Um, I probably am a bit of one. Yeah, I mean, I, I quite like, um, as you say, trying to trying to make sense of Christian faith myself, and then trying to help other people to understand it. Yeah. Um, I think uh, you're an innovator as well. From what I from yeah. little I know of you, I think you're I think an I innovator. Am. Yeah, I think I like doing new things and thinking up new approaches and new ideas and trying them out. And I get sort of energy from doing that. I'm more of a pioneer than I am a settler. I think. Yeah. I'm just sort of keeping things ticking over. I'm not that good at that. So, so you 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 then pursued the priesthood, and you're obviously ordained. And then you, from what I understand, you became involved in a theological college, not St. Melitis at the time, but another one. You got to quite a responsible position in that. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I did. A, I, I got ordained oh. um, in Exeter in the West Country. Mm-hmm. And um, I did. A, I was a curate for three years in Exeter. And then towards the end of that, began to think about what I should do. And um, what, what, what had actually happened is when I, when I went to, um, to theological college, uh, I'd done English for my first degree, which I, I loved. Um, but I then went back and did theology. Uh, and I found to my surprise, I, I really loved that too. Mm. Um, and uh, I found I was reasonably good at it. And so that was in the back of my mind when I got ordained. I thought, you yeah, know, I really quite like this theology thing, really thinking through faith. And so towards the end of my curacy, I, I was applying for jobs and wondering what I should do. And this job came up, which was a, um, and I, to be honest, I was a bit torn because part of me wanted to do more theology and I'd started doing an mm. MPhil, which eventually became a PhD. But I also quite enjoy people and pastoral work. And this job came up um, back in Oxford, which was part-time chaplain of a college, so pastoral work among students, and part-time teaching at a theological college, Wycliffe Hall in Oxford. Um, and I thought this would be quite good, because it would yeah. give me a chance to sort of try and do two of these bit things together, see which one's the right one for me. And um, so I did that for five years. At the end of that five years, uh, the theological college, Wycliffe, asked me if I'd stay on full-time. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I did, and um, stayed for another 11 years there, and eventually became vice principal. Uh, the college so that that really became that was the time when um uh the calling to theological work and to, to research and to writing and teaching in particular that really kind of embedded in in me which has been a big thing for me over the oh, years. absolutely i'm sure um and actually um i will at the end of this put up some um well, titles of the books that you've written yeah um throughout that time when you had that job um, went from the chaplain to full time and all that. Were there any challenges? Were there any God moments of significance throughout that time? Because mm. it's a huge span of your life, obviously. Sure. Yep. Were there any times where I don't know you, you you sort of just kind of thought crumbs? I just can't do this anymore. Or there were some really mm. gospel moments, yep. um, some real breakthroughs, supernatural moments, that yep. sort of thing. Sure. Anything like that? Yeah. Yeah, I think a couple of moments stand out as I look back on it. One, one was um, it was actually towards the end of my curacy. I. I the diocese said, said you know, would I, would I want to go to, to Israel, to Palestine, for, oh, for a yeah. study tour? There's um, St. George's, Jerusalem is a place, there's an Anglican centre in Jerusalem that okay. runs courses and so on. So oh, that sounds a good mm. idea. You know, if it's free, I'll go. Yeah. <laughs> so um, right, so I went and did this, did, did this course for about two and a half weeks, I think it was, in, um, in Jerusalem, based in Jerusalem. And I suppose it was my first real encounter with, you know, the whole church across the world and through the ages. Right. Because when you go to Jerusalem, you're suddenly aware that, you know, my own little church experience as a Baptist growing up, as a, you know, and I found my way into the Anglican church as a teenager, um, that's only one tiny part of the, mm. of the whole Christian church. And every Christian church has got a sort of base in, in, in Jerusalem. 
and you suddenly become aware not just of the events that happened there, the events of the Bible itself, but all the history that goes beyond that. And so, I, you know, it suddenly opened my eyes to, you know, that the church is, the church is big. Mm. You know, I'm part of something much, much bigger than I ever thought I was. I'm part of this church, which is not just Western and English or Irish. It's not just Anglican. It's not just Baptist. It's not just Protestant. It's not even Western with Catholic. It's Orthodox. It's, you know, the whole thing. Yeah. Um, so it stretches across the world, but it also stretches down through time, right the way back to the very early, earliest days of the Christian church and even beyond that into the history of Israel as well. So I suddenly became aware of this huge, great thing, the <laughs> church. Um, and that fascinated me. And I suppose that was part of... I remember coming back from that thinking, I just want to know more about this. You know, I've realized that people have thought about this Christian faith a lot, a lot more than I ever have done. I've only just begun to scratch the surface. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, it really you know, sparked in me a, a love for, for, for what I call um, historical theology. Right. Um, <clears throat> which is not quite church history. It's not just the kind of nitty gritty of what happened in the past, nor is it just sort of doctrine, abstract doctrine, but it's... it's Theology as it's been understood, as it's been developed, as it's, been, as it's taken root in different historical contexts. So I'm aware of time. Yep. So, so I want to kind of get into the St. Melitus sort of mm. side of things sure. and, and also to explain to people out there who might not know about St. Melitus College mm. what it is. Mm. Um, you're, you're obviously Wycliffe, I think you said, yep. and you've mm. been there for how many years by the time you're... 16 years. 16, so a long time. Yep. Um, and what was going on in your soul when, when that period of time starts to yep. come to an end and you sense it's going to yep. and you start pushing on doors to see what God's yep. doing next? What, what was your relationship with God like and what mm. was going on in your soul? Mm. Yeah. Well, say towards the end of that time, I'd been there 16 years, and um, I was the vice principal. The principal at the time was um, Alistair McGrath, that many people may have heard of. He's you know, a very fine theologian, written a lot of books. Yeah. Um, and Alistair decided to move on. He decided to, to resign as principal and move on to do something else. And uh, a lot of people were saying to me, well, of course, you'll apply for mm. the job. Um, and in one, many ways, it was the obvious thing to do. I knew the college very well. Uh, you know, I'd been teaching in the university. We loved Oxford. Our kids had grown up there. In some ways, the obvious thing to do would be to stay on and apply to be principal of Wycliffe. Um, it was a very prestigious college. It was the largest college in the Church of England at the time. Mm. Um, but there was something in my, my, my heart and soul that I just didn't want to do it. I think it was because maybe I'd... <laughs> I've been there so long, I could sort of see myself developing into one of those crusty Oxford academics. And you're an innovator. Yeah, maybe that's right, yeah. And the idea of just keeping something ticking over a few, few more years mm. didn't quite fire my, my soul. And I remember praying for a period of about three months at that time, you know, look, look Lord, if I've got this wrong, if I should be applying for this, if, I should do, if, if you really want me to do this job, change my heart. Mm -hmm. Make me want to do this job, make me excited about it. About it. But nothing happened. Right. Um, uh, and the deadline came and went. Uh, I didn't apply. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then someone else was appointed. And uh, I was slightly left feeling, oh, gosh, what have I done? <laughs> um, because I kind of realized basically by doing that, I'd, I'd, I'd basically kind of opened the door to leaving. Mm -hmm. But I had nothing, nowhere else to go at that stage. So it seemed to be clear that God was leading me in that direction to move on. But I had no idea where, where to go. So I had a lot of conversations at that time. There were a number of different options on the table. You know, one job in the USA, one, you know, a couple of things, one in, in Australia, something, other places as well. And so, but then there's this one, one opportunity came up, um, which was a kind of combination of, um, uh, I mean, I'd known Nicky Gumbel at HTB yeah. for, for, for many years. He and I have been tutorial partners when we trained for, for ordination together. We kind of kept in touch. Um, and over the years, I mean, going back to your question about significant experiences, I think one of the things that happened to me during that time was, was if you like, a, a discovery of the, of the kind of charismatic dimension of Christian faith, right. which had never really been part of my, my kind of upbringing. And as, as you can probably tell from listening to me, I'm, I'm quite a cerebral person. I tend to think things out quite a lot. But the experiential side of Christian faith was never particularly strong for me. But um, partly through my you know, friendship with Nikki, but also... Um, knowing quite a lot of students who came from that kind of background to Wycliffe, uh, who I found very engaging and very open-hearted and had a sort of joyfulness about mm. them that sometimes other students didn't have. I was kind of drawn to that and, and, and you know, through going to one or two sort of events connected to that part of the church, I, 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 again, not in a very dramatic, sort of powerful, overwhelming way where I fall on the floor and start foaming at the mouth or anything like that. That never quite happens to me somehow. Um, <laughs> but... In a, 
in a very sort of gentle way. I, I suddenly found my, my, my heart being warmed to this. Mm. I'm often reflected on that, that phrase of, um, of John Wesley's, you know, I felt my heart yeah. strangely warmed. Mm. And I think that's often how the Holy Spirit feels. Sometimes it's very dramatic. Mm-hmm. And absolutely, that's fine. You know, if, if people do fall on the ground and, and in very powerful experiences, I'm actually no problem with that at all. It just doesn't even happen to me very much. Mm. But for me, it was my heart being strangely warmed, I think, by the, by the sort of touch of the Holy Spirit. Right. Um, and uh, opening me up to the more experiential side of Christian faith. And so beginning to realise there was something in this. And so, um, so that, was, that was part of my um, uh, ex- ex- experience during those, during those years. I can remember going on, a, um, you know, on some of the sort of summer camps that were connected to HDB and mm. that kind of world, and actually sensing a, a, a kind of expansiveness, a sort of joyfulness, mm. a, a, an energy that I didn't often find anywhere else. And often people who come to faith through that form of, of, of Christian faith that you never would have thought of would have come to faith. And, you know, people who are with really difficult background in drugs and in alcoholism and, you know, people who've been in prison coming to faith in a way that I couldn't, you know, my cerebral approach to Christian faith would never quite do it mm. with them. Had to be something much deeper, something much kind of you know more experiential, and that kind of opened me up to that. Um, anyway, sorry, it's a bit of a no, no, it's good, good but, to know that. Thank you. But um, so I, I had had a few conversations with with Nikki at that stage, um, also with the Bishop of London, Bishop Richard Chartres at the time, who uh, also had a um, a vision for new something new in in London. Um, to cut a long story short. Uh, the offer came to head up something new yeah. uh, in in London, um, connected into the Diocese of London, but also to HTV, uh, something in the area of theological training. Um, I can remember... And was your heart strangely warm to it? It was. It began to think, yeah, yeah, that's, that's going to be interesting. Because I think what was going on in my mind is that um, while, while I loved Wycliffe, I loved uh, the, the, the environment it had, the you know, bright students, you know, teaching within Oxford University, supervising PhDs, you know, doing all that academic work. And I, and I, I love that, that's my thing. Um, but there was a part of me that was thinking, is, is this the best way to train people who are called to priestly leadership in churches? Right, right, right. Because what we're doing is we're teaching them a lot of good theology, mm-hmm. um, but we're not really teaching them how to use it in a mm-hmm. parish context. Um, and to be honest, you know, I, I can teach someone theology, but I can't teach them how to lead a church because I've never done one. Fair enough. Um, and in fact, most of our staff at, at the Theological College, we were all academics. Yeah, fair we, enough. We could teach academic theology, but we couldn't teach them to lead churches. Most of what people learnt about leading churches, they learnt from the churches they came from. Mm-hmm. And so I began to think, is there a way of doing the training where we can gain the best of the experience of life in the church with the best of academic theology and somehow put those together? Um, and so... I thought, well, if ever, if ever there's a chance to do this, yeah. this is it. Um, HDB, there's this amazing church with Indeed. the biggest church in the country, probably at the Anglican Church. Uh-huh. Um, lots of young people in it, um, resources to put into it. Uh, if, you know, if, 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 I, if I say no to this, I'll never get a chance to do this again. Yeah. This is a chance to do something innovative, new in theological training that I think really needs to be done. Um, and I'd often have conversations with students at the time, you know, in Wycliffe, who'd say, well, you know, I went into this because I, uh, I love to share my faith with people or I love to mm. preach or to pastor people or to lead the church. All I'm doing is writing essays, just churning out these essays all the time. And, I, you know, I would say, yeah, but the essays are really important. You need to do the theological work. But there's a little bit of me was saying, I can understand what you're yeah. talking about here. <laughs> um, so anyway, this, this opportunity came up uh, in 2015 and, sorry, 2005. Uh, the invitation came, and um, uh, we said yes. How did you feel? Uh, nervous. Um, that sort of strange mixture of excitement, but sort of edginess. You know, is this the right thing? But it felt like it. Okay, we got to take a take a bit of a leap of faith here. Uh-huh. Um, so we decided to move, and that, strangely enough, with that, we decided to move over one week. The week after. Uh, Janet, my wife, both her both her parents died within one week. Oh wow! Um, quite unrelated. Uh, her mother died um, on the Sunday, and her father dropped dead four or five days later. So we suddenly were faced with this sort of you know um, 
traumatic situation of a double funeral. Part of the reason, part of the attraction for going down to London was that uh, you know we'd be a little bit nearer to them as they were getting older, and suddenly yeah. um, that had happened. It was a very strange time, um, so we were adjusting to that really sort of traumatic event in our family life. Um, at the same time as you know our kids getting used to the idea of having to leave Oxford, the place where they'd grown yeah. up and all yeah. their friends. Um, so anyway, we moved down to London later that year. We start. I'd, I managed to recruit Mike Lloyd, um, who was teaching at St Stephen's House in Oxford at the time. I went to, to him and said, "Look, Mike, come on, you know, why don't you come and join me in this thing?" And um, so he said yes. Uh, I also knew that um, Rowan and Jane Williams had moved to Lambeth Palace relatively recently. I'd heard that as Jane, you do. <laughs> as you do, uh, that Jane was, you know, maybe wondering what the future might hold. I went to went along to Lambeth Palace and arranged a meeting with her and said, Jane, look, you don't really know me very well, but we're trying to start this new theological college. Mm-hmm. Um, would you join us? And she told me She told me later on, the only reason she said yes is because she thought it wouldn't happen. I love Jane Williams. I really um, do. <laughs> I genuinely think she's amazing. So she thought she wouldn't lose anything because probably it's not going to work, so I'll give it a go anyway. Anyway, the three of us started. And yeah, literally. The three we, of you, just three of you. Yep, yeah, just three of us. Um, with, oh, so we started doing a few courses for lay people. Uh, we got agreement after a year to take on, I think it was nine ordinands uh, in the second year, just to begin doing some training with so them. So he was doing like all the emails and the admin and all the bits and bobs and stuff. Were you just the three of you? Were you like just mucking in? Yeah, I mean, I had a, I had a PA. I mean, basically, basically HTB underwrote it. They sort of said, okay, we're going to, we believe in this. We're going to underwrite it for the first few years. Thank goodness for that. Um, the Bishop of London was behind it. Um, uh, in fact, the key thing that happened at one stage was that um, there was an existing uh, institution in London okay. and Chelmsford Diocese called, um, called the North Thames Ministerial Training Course. Mm-hmm. The principal of that decided to move on. Mm-hmm. And uh, so what happened was that this little thing we'd started within HDB called St Paul's Theological Centre mm-hmm. was brought together by the bishops of London and Chelmsford with North Thames to become this new thing called St Melitus. Oh, right. And that started in 2007. Wow. And it was a kind of slightly awkward thing because mm. it was... Uh, you know, on the North Thames side, they were very nervous and a bit, um, a bit uh, maybe a little bit threatened by the yeah. HTB angle. The HTB people were a little bit, oh, what are these other people like? And putting two bits together that didn't work natural bedfellows was a tricky, um, tricky thing to do. But um, that's kind of what we did. And, and certainly during that first year, there were many moments when I thought this has just all been a big mistake. I've heard you say this before. Um, and I would love you, if you're willing, to just talk about that. So it felt like a real dark night of the soul. Yeah. You'd given up many, many opportunities that came your way towards the end of your previous career. Yeah. And uh, some of them seemed quite attractive, to say the least. And here you are taking a brave pill mm. in, in founding something completely new um, from scratch and, and also a new way of training. Mm. And as you just started to testify, it really felt like a big mistake at times. Mm. And here, would you mind just delving into mm. the, how yeah. that felt sure. and why a little bit yeah. more? Yeah. Um, I think when, when you when you get an opportunity like that and you say yes to it, it's all very exciting. The, yeah, the yeah, idea yeah. is great. Um, the nitty gritty of it is oh, not yeah. quite so great. So you know, moving to London, leaving behind all our friends and um, contacts in Oxford, feeling a little bit isolated. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and in that first year, literally, I'd gone from being effectively. Uh, running Wycliffe Hall because in, in the interregnum after Al- Alistair had left, I was basically acting principal for a time. So I was basically running an Oxford college uh, with very bright students, um, a place where I knew very well. I knew how Oxford worked. I knew how Wycliffe worked. I knew how to get things done. It was a, in some ways a, you know, a, great, a great job. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'd left all that and I'd come to London. And in that first year, all I was responsible for basically was a was a short, a small course that they ran on a Saturday morning mm-hmm. uh, for lay people in theology, which a curate had done in his spare time for the last few years. Right. And there were moments in that first year I thought, what have I done? Mm. I've, I've given up a really, really good job, you know, with all the kind of academic interest mm-hmm. for me is a big mm-hmm. deal, to do something which is doesn't seem much responsibility at all. Were they sleepless nights? Um, sorry? Were they sleepless nights? Oh yeah, definitely, definitely, yep. And, um, and a sense of, there's no guarantee this will ever take off. Mm. Okay, there's this idea of doing a theological college, but what happens if it doesn't work? What happens if we don't get permission to train ordinance? What happens if we can't do a degree program? Um, what happens if three years down the line, I'm still running a little tiny course that 
the curate has done in his spare time. Mm-hmm. Um, I've left. So it was a real, real sense of, of um, a real doubt as to whether I'd done the right thing here. Um, and uh, I can remember it, it, it was at Christmas of that first year. So we'd moved in September and we got to Christmas and, and it, was a, it was a really difficult time because I remember thinking, you know, yeah, I'd hear stories from Wycliffe and everything was going mm-hmm. fine and, mm-hmm. and oh, I wish I was back there again and uh, I wasn't doing the academic stuff that I, was, that I loved. Uh, I was in charge of something really, really tiny that had no particular prospect of, well, it, there was no guarantee it was going to grow into anything. And um, I can remember that, that, that passage from Isaiah 43, you know, where God says to Israel, behold, I am doing a new thing. Behold, I am doing something new. Wait for it. That spoke to me in a very powerful way because I, I kind of held on to that and said, well, okay, maybe maybe God is doing something new here. Mm. And I've just got to hold on to it and we'll wait for it. Was there a particular moment when that sort of came to you, the power of that verse? Yeah, it was literally, I think it was a couple of days before Christmas. I think it was, I think it was in the lectionary readings, actually, that oh, that, right. that text jumped out, at me. jumped out at me and spoke to me in a very powerful way. And it was one of those kind of prophetic moments when... You know, the Holy Spirit is able to take a bit of scripture and speak in a very powerful way into your own heart. And so I kind of held on to that quite a bit mm, in mm. the coming months as things began to kind of just to, 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 to get going. But, um, but yeah, that first year was really, really probably the, one of the hardest years of my life, I think. And what was your relationship with God like at that time then? Um, uh, it was still there. There was lots of prayers of of, um, come on, God, I, you know, you, you better show up for me mm-hmm. here. Um, I've gone out on a bit of a limb mm-hmm. here. I've, I've tried to be obedient. Um, so come on, do your stuff. Um, and maybe they I like that, do your stuff. They weren't very, they weren't very reverent <laughs> prayers, perhaps, at times. Um, and he was kind of going back over, you know, things that had happened in the past. And that sense of, you know, praying for several months and God hadn't changed my heart and hadn't, led me back into Wycliffe and had opened the door to something else. Um, so, um, so yeah, so I think, you know, you, I think honesty in prayer is a really important thing. Yeah. That you don't feel you always got to say kind of respectful things to God. He can take it when you shout at him and complain to him. And Thank goodness. <laughs> and, um, and in a way, you know, claim the promises that he's given, even if he doesn't seem to be delivering on them at the time. And that's, that's kind of what I was doing, I think, at the time, saying, you know, come on, God, you'd better show up here. Mm. Um, so, and that, and that is not to say that I have any claim or, or, or um, right to expect God to do what I want him to do, but um, those are the kind of prayers I think I was praying right then. And jump into the present day, we're here towards the end of 2019. Um, as I was growing up, again, I, I don't know the exact figures, but I believe I'm right in saying that St. Melitus College now is the biggest theological college in the Church of England currently. It's got a centre, obviously, the, the mothership in London. There's one in the southwest. There's now one in the Midlands. And there's one in Liverpool. Mm-hmm. Um, it's got... Ham- and one in Nottingham now as well. And one in Nottingham now as well. Yeah, so London, Chelmsford, Liverpool, Plymouth, Nottingham. So five centres. And is, there, there's like, is it Kuala Lumpur? Yeah, one in Kuala Lumpur, one in uh, Bermuda as well. So, yeah. yeah. And, and when, you, when you think about that now, mm. and you cast your mind back to the time that you just very eloquently described where mm. you were just thinking, crumbs, what mm. have I done? Yeah. Do you have to pinch yourself? I'm yeah, good. I mean, it, people often ask, you know, did I envisage the future at the beginning? And the cl- clear answer is absolutely no. Yeah. Um, we weren't thinking of that scale at all. So now we've got, I think it's a 330 ordinands in training across the, the, um, the college in, in, in the Church of England. Um, uh, about 800 students doing courses of one kind or another uh, with us, as, as I say, campuses in other parts of the world. I, mean, I had absolutely no idea that anything like that would happen at all. I think it was one of those moments where you if you like, you put up a sail and, and the wind of the spirit just catches it. It was oh, something about the moment. Yeah, yeah. It was just the right time, the right place for something like that to happen. And we just caught the moment of the spirit. So what would you then, say to someone then who's perhaps in the situation you were in, where they're contemplating their future, but maybe they're feeling in their hearts that God has called them to do something which might be out of the ordinary, yeah. um, but unless there's a little bit of trepidation, but also a lot of excitement at the same time, what would you say? Yeah. What would you say to them? Well, I mean, there, there are no guarantees. Um, you know, we are always, we always just simply offer ourselves to God and say, look, do with me what you, what you want. Um, 
But I think I would say that I've often reflected on the, the parable of the the seed planted in the ground. Mm. Um, you know, unless a seed is planted in the ground and dies, it does not bear fruit. Indeed. And it's that word and dies, yeah. which is really powerful. And I've often sensed that, you know, that maybe the the deeper the, 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 the seed goes, the more the fruit arises. God, I'm getting all tingly. Um, uh, and in a way, you know, the the really dark days of that first year are somehow not unrelated to the fruit that's come right. in the longer term. That if you risk little, you maybe gain little. But if you if you do risk everything, there's the potential, the possibility of gaining wow. a huge amount at the same time. And so I think that's what I'd I'd say. And that isn't a it's it's, it's not a it's not like a slot machine. You know, it's not like you put a certain amount in and you get a certain amount out. It's yeah, not automatic no, but... like that. This is relational. Christian faith is always relational. We're dealing with a God who who you know who, who we are invited into a relationship with, and therefore there's no automatic thing but there's something in that i think that that i've often reflected upon um i'm really running out of time yeah. and, and, but i want to get that you're in saint Melitus, um and it's however many years in and then you get the calling from god to be a bishop how did the mm. actual calling come about mm. in my head i don't know why but i imagine mm. you in your office in saint Melitus in london and the phone rings mm. and it's i don't know maybe the archbishop of canterbury or the bishop of london i don't know how it works yeah. i have no idea of the procedure yeah. but you're there you're getting on your mark and you're doing whatever it is you're doing in your office and mm. then suddenly it's like you know, come, you know you have a conversation about being the bishop of kensington yeah yeah. What, how did it come about and how did you feel? Yeah. Uh, well, I, the Bishop of London at the time, Bishop Richard, had been a great friend and supporter and a bit of a mentor, I suppose. And he'd been talking for some time. You think, like, I, I do think you have a calling to oh, right. to uh, Episcopal oversight ministry in some way. And I was, okay, maybe, maybe just, you know. Um, anyway, he, he, I'd, I'd meet up with him every now and again for a chat. And one of these meetings, he, he called me and he said, hmm, Kensington. He <laughs> um, and he knew that the current bishop of Kensington was, was moving on, uh-huh. um, and uh, he asked me if would I would I be interested in this particular post. And um, initially, I was no, why would I want to do that? You know, I'm enjoying St Melitus. It's a it's a good place to be. And why would I want to? Anyway, the, the more he talked about it, and the more I talked with one or two other people, and particularly the the bishop of Kensington at the time, the, the more the thing began to fall into place because. I, I felt that my role at St. Melitus was not done yet. Okay. But I did feel that having done it for, um, you know, for, for, you know, led it from, from the beginning and uh, having been there for sort of eight, nine years, mm-hmm. uh, that my role, did I want to carry on doing that? Did my, my role need to evolve in some way? And I, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, actually, this could work in a way because it would mean, you know, if I have this sense that my role at St. Melitus isn't yet done but mm-hmm. my role needs to change and this could be a way of um of uh, continuing to support the college in a sort of in a way of stepping back but actually entering into a um a sort of different season of ministry where i'm maybe bringing some of what we've learned at St. Melitus and spreading that in, into the wider church as well because i think mm-hmm. we've learned a great deal about how how you bring the different traditions of, Christ, of the, the anglican church mm-hmm. together mm-hmm. how you bring a sense of life and energy and and um uh, and hope, you know, to the church, and um, and also it could be an opportunity to 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 do some more theology that was more, you know, public for the wider world right, rather than right. just within the academy. Yeah. Um, so it ticked a lot of boxes for me. It it, it meant um, a broader ministry in the in the church. It meant expanding my sort of right. theological interest. It meant um, retaining a, a continued involvement with some Melitus and supporting that. And so the more I thought and prayed over it, the more it, this one, it did feel, yeah, this could be the right thing. So I said, I said, yeah, I'll go in for it. Went through a process of being interviewed and um, I was asked to become Bishop of Kensington. I like to ask this theological question of, of all my interviewees because I just find it fascinating and uh, it's heart stirring. Imagine you are present in the garden with and you're perhaps you're a gardener so you're in the background but you're 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 able to witness what's going on at the resurrection Mm. that first easter day you've obviously been to the middle east you know Mm. what it looks like you know what it feels like so imagine yourself there which i imagine is quite a a a readily accessible thing for you to do in terms Mm. of landscape and you watch jesus engaging with with mary Mm. to start with 
And there's that conversation about, well, don't hold on to me yet, so I haven't yet risen to my father. Mm -hmm. All that's going on, and you're able to see it. Mm. What happened to humanity on that first Easter day? Mm. 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 Um, Well, I think a, a new possibility for humanity opened up on that day. That until that moment, we had no assurance that beyond this physical life there was anything substantial there might be an ongoing kind of vaguely spiritual existence with god in some way you know what the old testament calls hades or sheol or mm-hmm. something like that um but what we what we didn't have was this 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 absolute hard solid reassurance that there was something substantial something real beyond this life that this 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 sort of physical bodies that we have will be transfigured into another kind of physicality Mm. that is not less physical but maybe even more physical than than we are that we actually are now rather insubstantial and we will be much more substantial in the future if you like what we saw was a glimpse of the future Mm -hmm. like you know just in the person of jesus there and so um uh i think i think that's what it is that's when i I go back again to my sort of adolescent fears that there was nothing mm. beyond um, and that we were ultimately spiritual orphans. We were alone within the world. Um, and I think what happens at the resurrection is that absolute assurance we're not alone in the world. We're not spiritual orphans. There is something beyond this. Amazing. There is, you know, when that day comes when, you know, people are gathered around my, my bed or... Mm whatever happens to me and mm. I pass on from this life, that is not the end. Um, that's what resurrection talks right. about. And, and even more than that, that, that the whole world is destined for something more substantial. Mm. You mm. know, we're rightly anxious about climate change and about the, the, you know, the damage we're doing to our, our world at the moment. Mm. And we need to act on that. But at the same time, we're given this assurance that we act on it in the hope that mm. We're not doing that on our own. God himself is at work to bring mm-hmm. about a new heavens and a new earth and a new creation eventually. Bishop Graham, that's a perfect way to finish this formal part of, of the interview. Mm-hmm. Well, I say formal, so to be informal, yep. actually. Yep. Um, as with all these interviews, though, I do like to finish with what I call a spotlight. Yep. Um, it's just a series of questions, a bit of fun. Um, a psychologist would have a field day, um, but mm-hmm. it's really just a bit of fun to, to, to end uh, mm-hmm. the interview, if I may. Um, and it's just a quick fire round of questions. Mm-hmm. Some of the fun, some of a little bit more deep, that sort of yep. thing. Is that okay? Mm-hmm. Yep. And at the end, if you could just pray us out, that would be brilliant. Yep. Yeah? Okay, here we go. What's the thing you can't live without? I find it difficult to live without football. Cool. Uh, film star crush. Cool gosh. Um, Julie Christie. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Um, that was great. If you could have a superpower, what would it be? To see into the future. Oh, okay. Favourite cereal? Muesli. Very healthy. Very dark healthy. chocolate or milk chocolate? Milk. Every time. Absolutely. A lot of people have said dark and I just I don't understand it. it. Milk. When were you happiest? Ah, good question. Where was I happiest? When am I happiest? I think when I'm surrounded by people that I love and love me. All right. Favourite virtue? Kindness. You're in heaven for the first time and you meet Jesus for the first time. What's the first thing that you'd like him to say to you? I knew you all along. You're in heaven for the first time and you meet Jesus for the first time. What's the first thing that you'd like to ask him? What was it like on Easter Saturday? Or Holy Saturday? Bishop Graham, I can't thank you enough. You're a busy, busy man and you've just been brilliant. And I'm sure this video Mm. is going to touch the lives of countless people and Mm. and I hope across the world. Um, Would you mind praying this out, please? I'd love to, yeah. Father, we thank you for the gift of memory and the chance to go back over our lives and trace your hand uh, in the changes and chances that happen to us and I pray for all the people who might hear this uh, interview and might reflect upon their own lives and, we, and I pray Lord that, that they would be able to see your hand in their story as well that they would be able to put their trust in you in the dark times and uh, enjoy your presence in the good times and so we thank you for 
being with us as we've spoken today and pray for your blessing upon Chris and on all who uh, listen to this in the in the months and years to come in Jesus name